When the Black Death strikes in 1347, the world literally doesn't know what is hitting it. It also has no idea how to respond. There's no such thing as healthcare, let alone public healthcare. The existence of bacteria is not even imagined. They don't even know what is causing the disease in the first place. Gradually, it will become clear to a few people how the disease works and how it can be better managed. But even then, the response will be ineffective, inconsistent, and will largely fail. And in the wake of the destruction will come change that transforms human society forever. I'm Spartacus Olson. And I'm Andy Nidell, and this is Time Ghost Pandemics and the second part of our coverage of the Second Plague Pandemic, often known as the Black Death. In our last episode, we saw how large parts of humanity was struck by man-made disasters and climate change in the 13th and early 14th century, then struck by a disease pandemic of monstrous proportions. It is plague, which has now transformed from a disease mainly spread through flea bites into a highly contagious disease spread by breath and airborne droplets capable of devastating entire populations. From 1347 to 1351, it spreads from Crimea to Europe, the Middle East and Africa to finally travel east again through Asia and arrive in China in 1351. On its way, it kills up to 70% of the population of affected areas. It drives people into a state of terror that contributes to the spread of the disease as they flee in panic, carrying the disease with them to new areas. There is no cure, and to begin with, no one knows what to do. In Europe, the first place people turn to for a solution is the dominant social structure, the church. Pope Clement VI in Avignon, France, this was during the 67 years of the Babylonian captivity when the papacy was not seated in Rome, attributed the plague to divine wrath, and he ordered penitent processions to take place in afflicted regions. These could number in the thousands of people, and of course, thousands of tightly packed people marching around spread the plague ever further. They were not the only processions, however. The flagellants were already a radical group within the Catholic Church. These were penitents who whipped and beat their own flesh. During the Black Death, large groups of these form all over Northern and Central Europe. But they don't just beat themselves, they march. In groups hundreds strong, they have 30-day marches from town to town, during which they whip themselves and also during which they are not allowed to bathe. So. Filthy people with open wounds march in large groups from town to town. And when they arrive, they call all the people together to atone for their sins. Clement does officially condemn them in a papal bull and tells church leaders to suppress them. But this is easier said than done. But they didn't know they were spreading the plague. Or did they? And anyhow, what could you do about it? Well, surprisingly, they worked that out too. Quarantine and isolation. A few places in Europe are spared from the devastation. Large parts of the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth, parts of Flanders, Milan, and the central Pyrenean region in what is today the border between Spain and France. While we don't know exactly why these places avoid the terror of the rest of Europe, anecdotal evidence shows that it seems that not all regions might have been hit by the strain that produces plague pneumonia. Or perhaps the bacteria had in those outbreaks once again changed. But we do know that these regions all enforced strict quarantines and lockdowns. Now, there are other places that do so already in 1347 as well, like Venice, but they are still hard hit. Milan gives us a clue to why others do better than Unlike Venice, which imposed a 40-day quarantine on arrivals but did not lock down the entire city, the measures in Milan lockdown are swift, brutal, and ruthless starting already before the plague has even reached the city. At the time, Milan is ruled by a totalitarian government under the Visconti family. Lord Giovanni Visconti and his advisors now implement a draconian method of quarantine. They simply wall up any houses where the plague breaks out, leaving both afflicted and the still healthy to just die inside. To curb any further outbreaks, they put the entire city and surrounding areas under lockdown bringing trade and the entire economy to a complete standstill. Although for obvious reasons, the measures are initially unpopular, they gain wide public support as the positive effects become obvious. While most cities in the Italian land see as much as 
70% mortality, only 15% of the Milanese population succumbed to the disease. Only 15? Yep. Mm. Now, Visconti and his advisors tried to spread the word, but in other places, leaders are unwilling to resort to that kind of brutality, and any attempts at lockdowns face massive protests for reasons of damaging the economy. So, outside of these islands, the disease continues to spread, causing widespread fear and damaging the socioeconomic structures even. And when people are afraid and they panic, they look for scapegoats. Jews, for example, have often been scapegoats for European misfortunes, and they very much are again during the Black Death. Large-scale massacres of Jews, like, like the entire Jewish population of a town all at once, are common throughout much of Europe during these years. The plague is supposedly a Jewish plot directed from Toledo, Spain, to kill Christians by poisoning the wells. Of course, Jews also die of plague in the same numbers as their local communities do. Pope Clement, to his credit, issues two papal bulls condemning violence against Jews and saying that those who are blaming them for the plague have been seduced by the devil. He also has this to say, it cannot be true that the Jews, by such a heinous crime, are the cause or occasion of the plague, because through many parts of the world, the same plague, by the hidden judgment of God, has afflicted and afflicts the Jews themselves and many other races who have never lived alongside them. But it isn't just Jews or other minorities that are blamed for the endless misfortune, it's also witches. Witch trials were pretty rare before this period, but now they explode. By 1380 or so, trials of witches link things like magic and the weather, which obviously ruined the crops, which obviously brought the plague, are fairly common. Systematic witch hunts are common by 1430. Until the 1300s, the Catholic Church had said that witches could not control the weather because they were mortals, not God. By plague times, this is no longer the case. Now, as you hear, Indy's already talking about dates beyond the 1340s. As we noted in the opening, it will return in waves roughly every 20 years. During these epidemics, local populations will be decimated again and again and again. But we'll get back to that in a moment. Pope Clement had population estimates made in 1352 showing that roughly a third of Europe's 72 million pre-plague population had died since 1347. One out of every three people in five years. Some modern estimates put the death rates even higher, above 50%. And we know for sure that it was as high as 50% in some regions, like parts of Scandinavia, and that regionally it reached as high as 70%. Iceland is spared the Black Death at this time. But since the colder climate had caused it to be blockaded by ice, it too lost a huge chunk of its population in the early 1300s. Plague would finally reach Iceland from 1402 to 1404 and kill more than half the population. But despite the fact that the plague returns and people learn a little more every time, most of the world will ignore the lessons of previous outbreaks with some notable exceptions. These exceptions will help lay the foundation for modern healthcare sanitary prevention of contagious disease. In the aftermath of this first outbreak, some healthcare pioneers start organizing what will eventually become the medical profession based on vetting and licensing doctors. Already during the outbreak, the first temporary hospitals are created to isolate patients and treat them away from others. In 1423, the Plague Hospital in Venice becomes the first permanent institution dedicated specifically to healthcare. There, and in Genoa, Florence, and again Milan, the regional leaders install plague task forces led by administrative officials or plague guards with special powers to curb disease by initiating quarantines, lockdowns, and other preventive measures. By the turn of the century 1500, the system has amassed enough experience so that it has been generally accepted that plague is spread in two ways. It's either by contact with infected objects, which we know now has to do with fleas from household animals and stuff like textiles, or through contagion from one human to the other. So it's already clear that quarantine, isolation, and sanitation are essential, and yet the medics face massive resistance to implement sanitary reform and epidemic prevention measures. In the end, it means that the efforts only have marginal effect as they are seldom implemented stringently. But 
Fast forward to the end of the 16th century and the Europe-wide outbreak of 1582 and 1583. The plague guard in the town of Algero, Sardinia, Proto Medicus Quinto Tiberio Angelario. Wait, wait. Say that name again. Proto Medicus Quinto Tiberio Angelario. It's a cool name. It is, isn't yeah, it? It's cool. <laughs> anyway. He now makes a breakthrough in the first fight against the plague. When a sailor arrives in the town and dies from the plague, and two women who had contact with him also succumb, he wants to close down the town, but he faces massive resistance from the city magistrate and local businesses. He then goes straight to the viceroy, Don Michel de Moncada, and paints an apocalyptic vision of what is to come if they don't act immediately. Together, they proceed to close down trade and travel to and from the town, despite the resistance. Angelario then uses the findings of several other health researchers, like isolation of both infected and contacts of the infected, dividing convalescents in three different isolation centers to prevent reinfection, cordons of isolation, division of the town into healthcare districts with centralized response methods, disinfection of houses in which plague-related deaths had occurred with vinegar and whitewash, use of dry heat to eliminate the seed of contagion from everyday objects, and free medical treatment for the poor. Although we don't have exact numbers for how successful he is, we can deduce from baptisms, marriages, and limited economic data that while the rest of Sardinia suffers terrible deaths, an economic recovery takes many, many years. Algero not only sees significant lower death rates, but also recovers in a matter of months after the eight-month epidemic ends. He publishes his efforts in the pamphlet Epidemiology or Treaties on Plague with a dedication to the Viceroy. His work is then picked up and expanded on by other researchers, and so he lays down one of the founding blocks of modern epidemiology. It's also one of many small steps away from the domination of the church to dictate public health measures by religion towards a more scientific approach to understanding disease. It's a decline of the Catholic Church that begins already with the 1347 outbreak. Back then, the major part of the social fabric of Europe is very much centered on the Catholic Church. It's the basis of all aspects of society. But the church's position is now under attack from nature. First of all, the famines and natural disasters had a lot of people thinking, why aren't the priests doing anything about this? Aren't they supposed to be chosen? Of course, the papacy being taken to France did not help that, especially with a reputation for corruption, and the Western schism that began in 1378 and lasted nearly 40 years, which saw popes in Rome and Avignon, made it far worse. The rival popes excommunicated each other, which also meant that every Catholic in Europe was excommunicated by one or the other. But even on the smaller scale, the majority of parish priests and friars did their jobs and tended to the sick. This made their death rates as high or higher than the local populations. This caused further disillusion with those as chosen, and there were many priests, fearing for their own skins, who abandoned their posts and duties and fled the local outbreak. What do you think the locals thought of them? Six cardinals died of plague in 1348, three archbishops of Canterbury in 12 months, and while Pope Clement, who survived, did a pretty good job other than the processions, and even as Pope put himself at great risk and did not stop tending to the sick, as his advisors told him to, the infallibility of the Catholic Church took a major hit, and the basis of the disillusion that would culminate in the Reformation further down the line was established. And yet, the world will continue to suffer from the plague pandemic that starts in 1347 and just keeps on coming back again and again with isolated outbreaks even into the 18th century. For the first 150 years, the population in Europe will be in decline and only recover to the level of 1300 in the year 1500. The economic consequences of this initial outbreak that lasts five years is a recession in the known world that lasts for 50 years until the year 1400. Meanwhile, isolated areas like Milan avoid the worst economic effects by taking a worse hit on the short term, then seeing a more rapid recovery. The plague disrupts the entire social structure, disruption that has been argued to have launched both the Renaissance and the Reformation. But this 
is change that takes generations to have positive effect and costs tens of millions of lives. It's suffering that comes despite understanding the disease to some degree and even developing semi-effective countermeasures, but a mix of poor and inconsistent leadership, magical thinking, and scapegoating instead of addressing the problem leads to economic failure and death on an almost inconceivable scale. We'd like to once again thank James Curry, postgraduate in epidemiological research, for pointing us in the right direction for research on early epidemic prevention. Now, it's only thanks to the wonderful contributions by the Time Ghost Army that we can do our little part in making sure that we remember our past to better forge our future. Join the Time Ghost Army on Patreon.com or TimeGhost.tv. Subscribe. <coughs> ring that bell. Never forget. Ooh.